tendency to take take songs out. <laughs> we're just we're helpless without our words sometimes. Yeah. That is good. He's so good. I've just been a baby all day. <laughs> <laughs> I think of all the things the Lord's done for me, and I just Sleep. I don't even see why. through life we get going so fast and sometimes we just need to slow down and just realize what the Lord's doing <coughs> the heart's getting hard sometimes you get bitter sometimes just it's just overflowing us with all the love the Lord gives us Amen. Megan's going to rescue us. Okay. We'll come back to that one. We're going to be like Jonathan. We can't sing just one tonight. I can't take a heart that's broken. Make it up.
I know we've been in and out of revivals and meetings and, and just to bring us back up to pace. We've, we've talked about the person of God there in chapter number one. We talked about the people of God and um, uh, how we are supposed to love because God loves us. And that theme continues right on uh, through into the fourth chapter and it is 20 one verses, and we'll look at about the first 11, Lord willing, tonight. 
And so we'll begin reading in 1 John chapter number 1, or chapter number 4. Here I am being Jason Molinax. He done got me all messed up. We was in four different chapters and 29 different verses the other night. We finally all got in on the right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Chapter number 4, verse number 1. The Bible says, Beloved, or Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And that this is the spirit of Antichrist. Notice that's a little a. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Sounds a little bit like the Apostle Paul. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are, verse 6, of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the appropriation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we are also to love one another. That is the first 11 verses. And so beginning in verse 1 we find that it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. I once heard a pastor say that the scariest verse in all of scriptures in Matthew that says that there were many who will say in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works? Have we not cast out demons and devils? And he said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. That is probably the most scariest verse I would have to agree with that. And so John follows suit here and says try the spirits and I know Miss Rocky had asked me some weeks back and, and we're still Lord willing to do a study on this but that particular verse speaks of discernment. Discernment. And we as Christians need to have discernment. Now I brought my Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary with me on the phone. And so I didn't have to go back there and flip through a thousand pages to find discernment. But discernment is a noun, believe it or not. It is a noun. The act of discerning also the power or faculty of the mind by which it distinguishes one thing from another as truth from falsehood, virtue from vice, acuteness of judgment, power of perceiving differences of things or ideas and their relations and tendencies. The, error, the errors of youth often proceed from the want of discernment. It is the ability to tell the difference between them. So we need to have discernment as God's children and most importantly, we need to be able to discern that 
in God's house. I'll be honest with you, there have been meetings, uh, not only since I've been preaching, but down through my life that I know very good and well the first five minutes. I wasn't supposed to be there. Now maybe you've never encountered that, but I hate to tell you all this, but every time you sit in God's house somewhere it doesn't mean that God's always about. I know in our soul and in our spirit he never leaves nor forsakes us. But I will tell you there are places that God is not within a million miles of as far as his presence being known. And so uh, you guys don't have to turn with me, but I'm just going to turn back to the book of Proverbs chapter 2 and the first few verses. It said, My son, if thou wilt receive my words... <coughs> And hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He lifteth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. And when wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion, the Bible says, shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, discern. Just cause someone gets up and preaches or teaches or sings about something that's in that book doesn't mean that it's spirit-led and spirit-feed. Uh, I think that's been very evident down through the ages of time, and I hate to pick on these, uh, these, these individuals, and I'm not calling any out by name, but I think we've seen that so much down through the years in televangelism. Mm -hmm. Friend, if you watch some of those, now some of those are of God and are blessed by God and have grown and souls have been won for that labor, and to God be the glory for that. But there are some <coughs> that are nothing but a superficial something on this side of eternity. Uh, and I, we'll just leave that at that. We, won't, we won't, won't dig in there too far. But we need to have discernment of what is right and what is wrong. What is good, what is bad, what is scriptural, and what is carnal. And so John tells us to try those spirits. And sometimes uh, they can be difficult to discern. And that's why I think it's good to do studies such as this, or as we've done the studies on uh, prophecy, on tongues, on other things. It is needful for us to know these things. Uh, you know, it's just like a sporting event. You don't get to the championship game or the final round, uh, uh, the final championship round by not knowing what you're doing, right? So we need to have that same mentality. We need to train ourselves, study ourselves to be approved workmen that need not be ashamed. We need to uh, study the Word of God. So many times, and we're all guilty, the, the preacher's guilty. So many times we preoccupy ourselves with something of the world when uh, that we're looking for the answer for, and all the while the answer's in the book. And, 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 and as I touched a bit on um, Friday night when I was preaching, John in that fifth chapter in the 39th verse says, search the Scripture. Now, some of us are lazy. In fact, all of us at times are lazy. If it's not, y'all ever done this? Bible roulette. You wake up in the morning, you go. And you open your eyes and you're in Leviticus and you have no idea what they're talking about. And then that next morning you, and you. Well, John 3, 16, for God's so love. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I know y'all play Bible roulette. No, that's not what God wants us to do. God wants us to look and search. 
y'all didn't know you had sixty dollars worth of cane, change in the couch cushion until you went to looking for it, now did you? <laughs> Amen. God's word, there are some things that is laying on the surface. You know, it's like the plowed field, and we live in an area where there's a lot of Indian relics. And when they till this ground and they plow it and they chisel plow it and they disc it, a lot of times those artifacts come to the top and the rains hit hard and it hardens that field, but it washes away the impurities and we find arrowheads and tomahawk heads and, uh, and they're there right on the surface. But the greatest treasures, physically speaking, that have ever been found has been deep. I'm going to say something that's going to wow some of you all. And Lord, the federal government might shut up my house. How many of you know Farrowwood? Some of you has got family buried there. Some of you had family that lived there. In fact, at one time, between those four roads, there were only four landowners. And there was supposed to be a lake come in. I knew the man that surveyed that. He's since gone home. There was never going to be a lake in Farrowwood. That was a superficial clause to get the landowners to sign over their land for pennies on the dollar. You know why they did that? Because there's treasure on that mountain. You said, Preacher, you're crazy. I'll show you. <coughs> They've been found, but they know something that everybody else didn't. <coughs> And that's why they wanted it. It's somewhere. There's a lot of good treasure in God's word. But it's got to be found. So try the spirit. Some of y'all going to go home and start digging through history books. <laughs> looking through newspaper articles. I promise I'm, I'm telling you the truth tonight. And so we need to have discernment of God's word. And it says, verse 2, hereby we know that ye are the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. What that means is that those of us who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, yes, we're Christians, but there is also that, that God incarnate coming in, in flesh in Jesus Christ, and we have to believe that also. That he came and, and presented himself as a human being. <coughs> Those are the ones that cry. You can ask somebody, do you believe in God? And you'll have 99 out of 100 people say, yes, I believe in God. But do they know who Jesus Christ was? Yeah. And so those that confess Christ are of Christ. For with confession is made. Why? Because they believe in their heart unto salvation. Now, in verse 3, it says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that. Now, y'all listen. This is 2,000-year-old scripture. But listen how new it is. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. Now listen, and this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. <coughs> Breaking news, you all. The spirit of Antichrist, that old devilish, satanic nature, was alive and well in John and Paul's day. And I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say it's alive and well in the 21st century. Amen. And so not only have we heard that it should come, what did it say? That evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Well, not only was it bad in John's day, it is worse in our day. He said, 
Paul said, worse and worse. So, it's not going to get any better for the world. It's getting a lot better for the Christian. You can almost see the lights at home. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Boy, did y'all read that? I think we're going to read that again. Ye are of God. I like John's, uh, I like his typology here, little children. He's talking about the church. And have overcome. Not will overcome. Not might overcome. But have. That's past tense. So you and I are overcomers tonight. We don't have to overcome nothing. We have done overcome whatever it is out there in Christ Jesus. Well, guess what? As I've said this morning, gas might be $25 a gallon by week's end, but guess what? We've done overcome that. You say, preacher, what are we going to do? I don't know, but we've done overcome it. I might lose my job this week, preacher. You've done overcome that. I might lose my health this week. You've done overcome that. To die is the game, Paul said. I mean, it's like Miss Joanne said about her dear loved one. She's saved. Amen. Billy Graham said that when you have read in the morning newspaper that Billy Graham has died, believe not a word of it, but know that Billy Graham is more alive than he has ever been before. Death is but an instance for the child of God. Do you realize that? I took a nap a thousand times longer today, and Megan took a nap ten thousand <laughs> times longer today than that will that of death will be for the Christian. It is as simple as laying down to take a nap and awake in glory. That's how fast that happens. To be absent from is to be present with. It doesn't say to be absent from, we've got to take a two-week vacation and then. No. To be absent from this life is to be present in the one to come. That ought to get us excited. No matter what happens in the next 24 hours, two months, two years, 200 years, or 500 lifetimes, we have overcome by the blood of his cross. And so we find that in verse 5, they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. There are people in this walk of life that you will witness to, that you will share the gospel with, that you will be kind, that you will be joyous and happy in their presence all while trying to win them to Christ. And the sad truth of it is, unless the Spirit of God moves upon their soul in conviction, they will hear not a word you have to say. Amen. That's just the fact of the matter. Do we quit praying for those? No. But do we have to come to the realization that sometimes in the in the pressing matter, we may need to move on to the next one that will hear the word of God. That might be. Mm -hmm. We never quit praying, but sometimes we move the work along. And so, there's a spiritual deafness in our world. You know, there are people that think we are absolutely crazy for gathering at God's house on a Sunday, morning or evening or midweek service. They think we're the craziest things on planet Earth. They really do. They think we're crazy. And maybe maybe some of us are in an aspect. Maybe all of us are, but we're not crazy for coming to glorify the name of God. <coughs> but that shouldn't hinder us from keep walking. There is a spiritual deafness. Now, if we stay the course, verse 6 tells us that we will be allowed, we will be permissed, and we will be promised discernment. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. And he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby we know, uh, hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The only way we can know the difference in the two is by God's word. That's it. 
not by some commentator, not by Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary, which some believe is the second inspired work of the Holy Spirit of God. I'm just telling you the truth tonight. Not by our concordances, not by our encyclopedias, nothing, but simply by the Word of God. And so we need to stay in the Word of God and adhere to the Word of God and pray that the Lord move by His Spirit upon us with spiritual discernment. Verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. I think that is some of the most precious scripture in all of God's Word. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. And he, uh, verse 8, he that loveth not knoweth not God for God is love. We can say that we love people and I hope we do. But do we love them to the point more than ourselves as the Bible commands us. Let me, let me put this into perspective for you tonight. We go at random to Main Street America and we pick out one individual, man, woman, child, teenager, and we invite them into our home and they can go to our cupboards and our refrigerators without permission. They can sleep in our beds without our permission. They can drive our cars. They can come to work with us. They can see those things hidden in the back closet. Do we truly love our neighbors more than ourselves? Jesus said we had to. He didn't say it was a possibility that we might. It says that we have to. I'll give you this commandment, that you love one, another, uh, one another, love your neighbor as yourself, and love the brethren more than yourself. Well, preacher, I don't like that. Well, you just had to take it up with Jesus. He didn't say it, I didn't. John calls us out on some things. Well, I don't want nobody messing in my stuff. Well, it ain't your stuff to start with. It ain't my stuff neither. I'm going to use this, for instance. I got, I got a, it, it, it blows my mind, really. So, uh, I, I bought me a motorcycle. I think y'all know that. <laughs> and it blows people's mind. Preacher, you got that motorcycle? Yeah, I do. I'm gonna come out of that thing. Keys on, keys on hanger. Take it and hang on. What? You, you, you let me ride your motorcycle? Yeah. Why? I'll never forget Brother Mike Mercantine and AJ, two men I loved to death. And AJ was like Evil Knievel. And there was a very wealthy lady in Whit County, and she had this. This is back in the day. Y'all remember back in the day? Some of y'all didn't even know what back in the day is. But back in the day, this lady had a car that was well worth over $100,000. And this has probably been 25, 30 years ago. Multi-million dollar estate. And AJ said, man, called called by name. And he said, can I drive your car? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like putting a stick of dynamite in a five-gallon bucket of gasoline. I'm just <laughs> And she said, well, certainly you can. And his brother said, you're going to let him drive your car? He said, yeah. And then she said, Brother Mike Strait, she said, let me tell you something, sonny. I own my thing. My things don't own me. Boy, that, that'll get home to somebody. So yeah, if you're a licensed driver, my insurance will cover you. Anybody wants to borrow my motorcycle, you can come get it anytime you want. It's just a thing. And we should be that, like that in every aspect of our life. Elijah said, told the widow woman, go, go make me a cake. But 
a preacher. I don't have but a handful of meals and a little and cruise. What'd he say? He's a stern man of God. Y'all ever realize that? He's like, go make me a cake, woman. <laughs> that's, so, that's pretty much how he said it. And in obedience to God, look what a blessing she got out of it. Yeah. Now she could have went in her house and dimmed up the door. And she'd have never been talked about in all of Scripture. But here we are some thousands of years later talking about a little woman with a handful of meal and a cruise of oil. And what a blessing she was to not just the man of God, but how much a blessing God was to her. Because she opened her house. Boy, we could stay there a while. Eternal love. Verse number 9 says, it, In this was manifested. Manifested simply means to be made known the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. See, that's the only way we can live is in Him. The Bible says that in Him, we live and we move and we have our being. It's in him and by him and through him and only him. It's Jesus plus nothing minus nothing. It's just Jesus. That's the story of the gospel, y'all. It's just Jesus. I don't know if y'all figured that out yet or not. I mean, there's whole four whole books called the, the Gospels According To. And it's all about him. And then there's 66 books. And guess what? They're all about him. There's 1,100 chapters. Guess what? They're all about him. There's 36,000 verses. Guess what? They're all about him. There's over a million words in your Bible. Guess what? Every one of them points to Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's all about him. And so we should live with that mindset. You see, verse 9 tells us that our hope is in his cross. Not in the literal cross, as the man was talking about in revival the other night, but the cross, the finished work of Calvary. And that's our only hope in this life, is the cross of Calvary. And so guess what? Verse 10 says here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the appropriation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought, ought to love one another. Let me put that in the contextual meaning tonight. We have been forgiven, therefore we must forgive to know how to truly love one another. <clears throat> Do we all have enemies? Yes, we will. I'm glad we brought that up tonight. I got a lot of enemies. Preacher, well, me too. Some of them I don't know why, but they just are. But guess what the Bible says? Love your enemy. In fact, the psalmist said that one of these days he's going to prepare a table. Y'all realize that? I'm going to paint this picture. I'm about done. The psalmist is literally saying, I'm going to prepare you a table in the presence of your enemies. <laughs> One of these days, our very enemies is going to have to sit across the table and watch us partake of the Lord's goodness and grace. And guess what? They ain't going to get to say nothing about it, but they're going to have to endure watching us do it. So what are we worried about? Shouldn't be worried about nothing. He said, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. We're going to get to have communion in front of our greatest foe one of these days. Ain't that something? You know, we always read these scriptures and we're like, I've heard that. I've done that. I'll be honest with you. Before that message Friday evening, I had heard that, that passage of scripture preached on uh, probably as many times as any other thing in the Bible. When I read that Spurgeon outtake on Search the Scriptures, and boy, you start digging, and guess what? Them treasures is there. We just got to find them. We got to get dirty. Sometimes we only, always don't have to wear our Sunday best. Sometimes we got to wear work clothes to find the goodness of God. 
So I pray that you got a blessing tonight. I had a blessing studying it this evening after my nap, Miss Megan. <laughs> got a refreshed mind, refreshed soul, and uh, there's good things in there. We just skimmed the surface on those texts tonight. But uh, let's just thank the Lord for his goodness and his grace and maybe go out and tell others about it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us here on this beautiful Sunday evening. Father, we thank you for allowing us to look to the Word of God for encouragement, Lord, for discernment, Lord, for everything we need in this walk of life. Lord, thank you for being good to us. Thank you for shattering us with grace and being long-suffering. And Father, may we go out and just love on somebody. Father, show the love of God because it's shed abroad in our hearts. Father, we pray that you would bless us as we go to our next appointed destination. Bless those that are traveling. Bless those that are in meeting. Bless those, Lord, that just need a touch from you. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.